Has anyone ever heard of windmill? I don't mean the structure windmill. I mean the fast food restaurant. It's got a few locations in New Jersey. Most of them, I think, are on the shore. I know the original is in Long Branch. That's our uh, topic is for our latest installment of the Jersey Shore Towns segment. So in 1963, Windmill was opened in Long Branch, New Jersey. I'm talking about that for a reason. Because I didn't anticipate talking about the restaurant. However, when I was at ShopRite this morning, um, I saw in the aisle where the hot dogs are, I saw Windmill hot dogs that are made specifically for the Windmill by a company in New York. I want to say it's the same company that makes Sabrettes, but I'm not quite sure. So if you are from New Jersey, if you've ever been to the windmill, they make a great hot dog. I'll be having at least one this week. I'll also be making hot dog and potato casserole. If you've never had that, I highly recommend it. I will put the recipe in this episode's description. So if you ever go to windmill, you'll probably know, you'll know it by the, the structure itself. It actually has a windmill on it, the original in Long Branch. So getting back to Long Branch itself. If you want to take a look, you can look at the my YouTube channel. I've got some links to videos on Long Branch like I do for each of the episodes where I post other people's videos. Just to give you an idea of what people say about a certain place, it gives you a little bit more detail because I'm trying to keep these short. So that said, welcome to the New Jersey History Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Whitfield Manor. Now, Long Branch, what do you know about its history? If you know Long Branch, do you know anything about its history because... Before I went to college there at Monmouth University, I'm wearing the sweatshirt today, I didn't know much about Long Branch history at all, even though it's only maybe 25 minutes north of me. I found information that the first settlers arrived in the area in 1668, but the area was not really established and fully settled until 1867. You'll know that that's around the same time that other local towns were established, like along the shore area there in Monmouth County. Long Branch is known for being the stomping grounds of seven U.S. presidents, including Ulysses S. Grant, James A. Garfield, Chester Arthur, Benjamin Harrison, Rutherford B. Hayes, William McKinley, and Woodrow Wilson. There is a park in town known as Seven Presidents Park and a church called the Church of the Presidents, not because they are worshipped there, but because they worshipped there. In the United States, we do not worship our leaders. Well, we didn't used to anyway. The church is a deconsecrated Episcopal chapel, which is now a museum. Here's a side note, because we like side notes. Chapels were very common along the New Jersey shore and were built to basically supply the needs of summer residents and vacationers. You come down for vacation, you come down for the summer, you want a church to worship on Sunday or for for special days. Well, As the shore's year-round population grew, some of these little chapels that were only really operating in the summertime, they became full-time churches. Others were also closed because larger structures were eventually built to house the the worshipers and people who were moving down and living here full-time. So maybe if you were like me, where I live in Brick, down the road from me, there is a church, a Roman Catholic church, called the Church of the Visitation. The Church of the Visitation was originally a smaller building that is next to the bigger full-size church now. What they do now is they use the smaller building for like as like a parish hall. So if you live in a town, like a shore town, where you uh, maybe have a church on that property, there may be a smaller building that was once a chapel. Or... Your church may have had a chapel that that they closed and then made into the bigger church. I think everybody gets the picture. So many of these shore towns had these little chapels that would uh, welcome people in the summertime, like maybe from May to September. They'd have their services there during the week, weekend, Sunday, and then whatever during the week. Then they'd close up in September. People would go home and have their home churches, usually like Philadelphia, North Jersey, New York City. And then as people moved down, A lot of those little chapels were closed because larger churches built were built to house a growing full-time year-round population. Some of the church, some of the little chapels stayed and maybe became part of the parish. Um, 
if you take a look at the New Jersey shoreline, you want to look at Long Branch. It's a little more than halfway between um, Atlantic City and New York, just to, just to give you a, a little bit of a background. So getting back to the town itself, President Garfield died in Long Branch. You might know the story if you're a New Jersey history person. He died in Long Branch after being brought to the New Jersey shore to recuperate after being shot by Charles Guiteau in 1861. I'm sorry, 1881. That was 1881. Garfield died from the from the gunshot wound, but it was more, they think, um, from his doctors kind of probing in his body with their fingers, which they probably hadn't washed. They were trying to remove the bullet. I, I'm I'm not quite sure, but I kind of want to say that if they'd left him alone, maybe he would have survived. Not quite sure, but he was doing better. He was recuperating, and then time as time went on, he was being explored more and more. It got worse. I think there's a story that they brought Alexander Graham Bell in with kind of like an early metal detector type thing, and they were trying to um, put it on the president's body to see where the bullet was so they could remove it. And they were actually picking up the metal bed springs on the, in, in the bed. And, and that's that's what made them keep like looking, digging around inside, thinking they got in the bullet. I think they were picking up the bed springs, but that could be a myth. I, I just thought of that, I didn't research it. So if you wanna research it, feel free to do that. So President Garfield is brought here to New Jersey, to Long Branch to recuperate after being shot. What they did was they built special train tracks um, from the, the train depot, I guess you could say the, the train station, to the shore so the president could be more easily moved. And what they eventually did was they tore up the railroad ties and they built a structure called the Garfield Tea House, which is a small little structure there in that area. I will, it, I think it's in um, Elberon, which is right around that area of, of, uh, of Long Branch. I'll put a link in the description to the Garfield Tea House. Tiny little, tiny little building, but very interesting. Long Branch became a major summer location and like many places along the shore, became a year-long residential community by the late 1950s and into the 1960s. Like neighboring Asbury Park, Long Branch experienced its share of racial conflict during the 1960s and similar to many shore communities, Long Branch became home to many African-American people who worked in the service industry. Remember, we talked about that in Asbury Park, how many African-American people worked in the hotels, worked in the restaurants and places like that, and they lived on the opposite side of town. It was very similar in Long Branch. And I didn't know this. Speaking of African-Americans, Long Branch experienced its share of racial segregation. For example, in the 1930s, people had to fill out an application for beach access to one of the beaches in Long Branch. African Americans, not surprisingly, were given access to the same beach. Let me let me read. Um, this is from an article um, from the New York Times, September 2018. I usually don't read from the New York Times. I don't like to read from any newspaper. I hate to say that, but you know nowadays you can find any print article to fit your own personal beliefs. But this is actually, you can't argue with facts, right? I guess some people could. In the 1930s, Long Branch, New Jersey, passed an ordinance requiring all residents to apply for a pass that would allow access to only one of the town's four public beaches. Town officials claimed the rule was meant to prevent overcrowding. Without exception, though, black applicants were assigned to the same beach and were denied entry to the others. So there's an example of the segregation that you would have seen in Long Branch, just like in other parts of New Jersey. But of course, according to some people, that didn't happen. So bizarre. Martin Luther King spoke at Monmouth College, which is now Monmouth University, in 1966. At that time, with much of the nation embroiled in race riots in major cities, the strife had not yet reached the New Jersey shore. Remember, if you listen to the Asbury Park episode, um, July 4th, 1970, that's when Asbury Park had their race riots. So we're still in the 1960s here. I'm just, I'm just kind of giving you a little background here um, with regard to race relations because they can kind of pop up everywhere I look with the Jersey Shore towns. And I think that's because of the African-American people who were working in the service industry. 
Asbury Park columnist Bill Handelman, who died in 2010, reflected on the famous civil rights leader's visit, meaning Martin Luther King. Handelman recalled that Monmouth College was then a small liberal arts school, not particularly known for being all that liberal. Quote, in the autumn of 1966, Monmouth County was a safe place, out of range. Handelman wrote, seemingly stuck in the happy days of the Eisenhower administration a decade earlier. So here's someone um, who wrote for the Asbury Park Press. He died in 2010, but he's recalling when Martin Luther King visited Long Branch, West Long Branch, Monmouth College, now Monmouth University, in 1966, that this area of the country seemed to be stuck in the 1950s. Like, like I mentioned, that all the racial tension, I guess it was here, but it hadn't boiled over yet, which, these are my words, that would change as the decade ended. Status quo at the Jersey Shore was, by 1966, status quo the same, but not for long. Long Branch continued to grow into the 1970s, with many different immigrant groups settling in the area, even back as far as the 1930s, Italians, Irish, and Jews. As the 1960s became the 1970s, Long Branch, like its neighbor Asbury Park, began a sharp decline. Also like Asbury Park, Long Branch has seen a rebirth. If you haven't visited Long Branch, I highly recommend visiting Pier Village, beautiful complex. You can enjoy a $20 martini, I'm not kidding you about that, a $20 martini and you can look at apartments with rents of $4,500 a month, plus utilities. I'm not joking about that. And I'm kind of laughing like internally because I know that area of Long Branch. And even when I was in college in the 90s, that area was in bad shape. And now they're getting $4,500 a month for rent in these high rises in the Pier Village in Long Branch. I'm kind of thinking back to how I'm, I'm thinking back to what I know about Long Branch being settled by shore people, vacationers in the 18, late 1860s, what it must have looked like, then that period of, of uh, growth and then decline and now extreme growth again. Famous people from Long Branch. Bruce Springsteen was born in Long Branch, but of course he has ties to every New Jersey town if he breathed there. Frederick Douglass lived in Long Branch for a short time, the abolitionist, former slave and abolitionist. Garrett Hobart, former vice president under William McKinley. Arthur Bell, grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, was born in Long Branch. Remember, I talked about him in the Ocean Grove episode where he spoke at an Ocean Grove meeting to much praise from the crowd. And President Grant lived on and off in Long Branch in a cottage presented to him by the Republican Party. I think it was there where Grant wrote his memoirs, which if you know anything about General Grant, he was pretty, President Grant, he was pretty much bankrupt. And it was the publication of his memoirs that let him, allowed him to leave money for his family after his death. I think he died of throat cancer. If there's anything you'd like to add about Long Branch, please email me and I'll add it in, an, in a following episode. My email is njhistorypodcast at gmail.com. I always like seeing emails. I've been getting a few, I would say maybe three or four a week, which is nice. Um, Three people recently have said to me that they're enjoying the podcast, and two of those people said that they'd wish they thought of creating a New Jersey history podcast themselves. And I don't say that to say, ha, 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 I beat you to it. I say that because I truly am open to collaboration. If anybody wants to give me input or wants to actually come on and do a video with me, if you looked at my last episode on Clinton Road, that was not even my idea. That was the idea of my student whom I interviewed, Kevin. So I'm very serious about making this a collaborative effort. So if you are really into this, please reach out. I will gladly discuss collaborating with, with uh, people. I'm talking to two people right now um, on Instagram. I'm not going to say their names yet because I haven't really asked them if, if they wanted me to make this public yet with regard to their names. But we're talking about two upcoming projects after the summer is over when I finish the Jersey Shore Towns segment or series, I guess is a better word, doing something on random towns where people just tell me a town and I do a short 10-minute episode per week on it 
In the summertime, those would be Jersey Shore towns, but not in the summertime. Any place is, is fair game. And the other series we're thinking about, um, as suggested by a listener, is um, a series on the roles of women in history of New Jersey. So kind of like, like looking at maybe particular groups. If you want to follow me on YouTube, the New Jersey History Podcast channel. Instagram is NJ History Podcast. TikTok is Mr. KB History NJ. That's really just more fun. Originally, that was for my students, but other people have joined, and, and it's it's just nice to be on TikTok because you, I mean, for me, I'm learning a lot how to use technology from that. And Facebook is Kyle W. Banner in parentheses, the NJ History Podcast. I don't do much on Facebook because I consider it pretty much a cesspool. And to use Thomas Paine's words, it, quote, sets us at variance, end quote, with others with whom we'd otherwise be friends. If you haven't listened to my latest episode, have a listen as I discuss the haunting tale of Clinton Road, which I mentioned before, with one of my former students. Have a lovely day and look for the next full-length episode on the Dutch colonial origins of slavery in New Jersey. Maybe you can hear those motorcycles going on their way to the beach, doing some compensation there. I guess I keep saying that, but I think you get my point. And listen for my weekly short reading episodes where I pick a little story to read. If you have anything, even if it's original material you'd like me to read it on the podcast, I will certainly do that. I'm thinking about writing my own little stories as well based on New Jersey history and sharing them. So listen for my next full-length episode, Dutch Slavery in Early Colonial New Jersey, and my next reading episode. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be reading yet, but you'll see it when it's up. And as always... Feel free to reach out with any suggestions.